Welcome to Worship from beautiful Savior Lutheran in Waukesha, Wisconsin. I'm Peter Schmidt. I have the great privilege of serving as pastor here at Beautiful Savior. Thank you so very, very much for taking some time during your day to make worship of our Lord a priority. Now, you may have noticed that my stole is red. The pyramids on the altar are red. The reason for that is that color represents the work of God, the Holy Spirit. And this day, we are celebrating the work of God, the Holy Spirit, through a person, Martin Luther, as well as some other people we call reformers, who during the 16th century were used by God to bring the church back to where God wanted the church to be, centered on the word, his family story. And so last week, if you were with us, you may remember that we started a series going through First Thessalonians that will talk about different aspects of what the church is. Last week, we celebrated that the church is family. Well, every family has a story. Our family story is recorded for us in the scriptures. And over time, unfortunately, the Christian church began to add or subtract from that story, which is always centered on Christ alone. Martin Luther was used by God to bring the church back to the scriptures, back to Christ alone, to God alone being the glory as we celebrate the fact that we are saved by faith in Christ alone, so faith alone, as a result of God's grace alone, his undeserved love alone, as it is recorded for us in the scriptures alone, not scripture plus tradition, not adding or subtracting from the family story, but rejoicing in just what God has given us in his book, his Bible, given to us so that we might know Jesus. Our worship begins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You shall have no other gods. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. We should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble. Pray, praise, and give thanks. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. Honor your father and your mother. We should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. You shall not murder. We should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in their body, but help and support them in every physical need. You shall not commit adultery. We should fear and love God so that we lead a pure and decent life in what we say and do, and husband and wife love and honor each other. You shall not steal. We should fear and love God so that we do not take our neighbor's money or possessions or get them in any dishonest way, but help them to improve and protect their possessions and income. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. We should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray them, slander them, or hurt their reputation, but defend them, speak well of them, and explain everything in the kindest way. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or get it in a way which only appears right, but help and be of service to them in keeping it. You shall not covet your neighbor's spouse or their manservant or maidservant, their ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. We should fear and love God so that we do not entice or force away our neighbor's spouse, workers, or animals, or turn them against them, but urge them to stay and do their duty. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your punishment now and forever. 
but I am truly sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. to get into our family story through our scripture readings. Our first reading is from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. 
the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our second reading is from John chapter 8. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. What do you believe concerning God the Father? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, spouse and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. What do you believe concerning God the Son? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. What do you believe concerning God the Holy Spirit? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. steadfast in your word Curb those who by deceit or sword would seek to overthrow your son and to destroy what he has done Christ, your power make known, for you are Lord of lords alone. Defend your Christendom that we may sing your praise eternally. O Comforter, Priceless worth, send peace and unity on earth. Support us in our final strife and lead us out of death to life. O 
Welcome to Pup Time with Pastor. I'm here with our good friend, Maurice, our friendly black bear from Northwoods Beach, Wisconsin. How are you doing today, Maurice? I'm upset. You're upset? How come? Messed up my favorite story. They messed up your favorite story? What are you talking about? Saw a movie. Saw a movie? About Goldilocks, three bears. About Goldilocks and the three bears? Totally changed it. Totally changed it? Goldilocks wasn't even a girl. Goldilocks wasn't even a girl. No porridge. No porridge. Tofu instead. Tofu instead. Not even beds. Not even beds to sleep on? Well, what did Goldilocks, who wasn't even a girl, do instead of trying out the beds? Played gaming systems. Played gaming systems? Man, that's a totally different story. I'm going to write a letter of protest. You're going to write a letter of protest? Oh, man. I'm going to post it in the school for everyone to sign. You're going to post it in the school for everyone to sign? Wow, you're really upset about this. It kind of sounds to me like you're just like Martin Luther. What are you talking about, Pastor? What am I talking about? Well, as we're remembering Reformation, remember how on October 31st, 1517, the eve of All Saints Day, Martin Luther posted 95 theses or statements to debate? on the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany? Mm, yeah, I remember. Was he protesting Goldilocks? No, he wasn't protesting people messing up Goldilocks' story because I don't think that was even written yet. But he was protesting the fact that people were messing up a story, the most important story ever. Whose story is that? God's story. Yep, God's story. And where do we learn God's story? In the Bible. Yep in the Bible. You see, what was happening during his day is people were changing the Bible. It's not that they were adding different books to it and subtracting words from it, but because a lot of people didn't know what the Bible actually said, well, people in the church were teaching things that the Bible didn't say. They were changing the story. What was the most important thing they changed? The most important thing they changed? What well, was really about Jesus? Why did Jesus come and die on the cross and rise for us? So we can have eternal life. Yep, so we can have eternal life. And before we have eternal life, well, what has to happen to our sins? We need to be forgiven. Yep, need to be forgiven. Now, how does that happen? Because of Jesus. Yep, because of what Jesus did for us. Well, people in the church were changing the story and saying we could even buy forgiveness if we bought something called an indulgence, or if we did all the right things, God would let us into heaven. How much is enough? How much is enough? That's the problem. Because we're sinners, we need God's forgiveness, God's grace, his undeserved love. And so Martin Luther, when he posted those 95 theses, he was like you, protesting the fact that the story of Goldilocks was changed. Well, he was protesting because, well, God's story was changed in the Bible. That's why we remember Reformation, and we pray that God would help us not only to hear the word, but to understand it through his Spirit's power, and then to live according to it. And one very, very important thing. Don't change it. Yep, exactly. Don't change it. Don't add to it. Don't subtract to it. Just tell the story. And by the Spirit's power, believe that story, love that story, and... Share that story. Yep, share that story. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that in our message, but before we do... Let's sing the hymn. Yep, let's sing the hymn.
keeps us free from every need that has us now will take the old evil form now means deadly war deep guile and great might are his dreams Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, when we think about the Reformation, the first thing that usually comes to mind is what Martin Luther did on October 31st, 1517, the Eve of All Saints Day, All Saints Day being this huge celebration in the life of the church, a day when he knew many people would be coming to worship in church. So what did he do? He posted something, 95 theses or statements for academic debate on the church door, which was like the bulletin board of the day. Why? So people would read it and start to question some things. 
things that he was questioning, things that the church was teaching in that day, things that he realized were now contrary to the word of God. We might not understand how this works because the word was so ava- is so available to you and me in so many forms, but in Luther's day, not so much. And so when he finally was studying in the university, the scriptures, he found in the scriptures things that were taught that were not being taught by the church. In fact, certain practices like selling indulgences in people understanding this to mean they could buy forgiveness. Well, that was not at all what the church should be teaching because the scriptures make clear that it's all what Jesus has done for us through his perfect life, sacrificial death, glorious resurrection. It's not Jesus plus something, it's Christ alone. Now, some of us might also think about having to color, maybe in Sunday school or Christian day school, Luther's coat of arms, his seal, where we hear grace alone, faith alone, scriptures alone. And then, of course, the hymn we just sang, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, penned by Martin Luther. Now, we might have the impression that all this happened like in one or two days, but no, it was a process. And really, publicly, it began when Luther nailed those 95 theses, but the Reformation continued over a long period of years. In fact, the hymn that Luther wrote, A Mighty Fortress, that was probably written 10 or so years after Martin Luther posted the 95 theses. Dr. Albert Culver writes, Most scholars think Luther wrote the hymn between 1521 and 1529, with the majority of scholars settling on 1527 to 1528. These years were some of the darkest in Luther's life. While we are not certain what prompted Luther to write the hymn, scholars have suggested a number of events during these dark years. In August 1527, a man who followed Luther's teaching was martyred. In the fall of 1527, a plague broke out in Wittenberg. In December 1527, Luther wrote to a colleague, We are all in good health except for Luther himself, who is physically well, but outwardly the whole world and inwardly the devil and all his angels are making him suffer. A few days later, in January 1528, Luther wrote that he was undergoing a period of temptation that was the worst he had experienced in his life. Now, when Luther speaks of temptation, he uses the German word anfechtung. While anfechtung is translated temptation or trial, it refers to anything that causes anxiety, doubt, fear, suffering, or terror in a person's life. For instance, in December 1527, Luther's daughter Elizabeth was born sickly. In May 1528, she died. The six months of wrestling with the Lord in prayer to save his sick daughter was a period of temptation, anfechtung, in Luther. He was mentally and spiritually fatigued. He was under the cross of suffering. Yet he took comfort in the Psalms and trusted in the promises of Jesus. Besides the challenges brought on by the plague and the tragedy in his personal life, struggles abounded in the church. Luther felt that his family reputation and work for the Reformation, that his entire existence was at stake. Have you ever felt that way? That you're under just these attacks. Things aren't going well. The evil one keeps bringing up all the ways you fail. And maybe you have some physical struggles going on or struggles in the lives of people who are near and dear to you. There's a truth that we see throughout Scripture, a pattern, if you will. God does something great, and then the evil one tries to mess it up. It might not happen immediately, but over time, he'll bring those spiritual attacks on you. But here's the truth. In Jesus, we win. But you see, here's the thing. Take a look at this picture. You see on the left side, well, me, holding my granddaughter Elena when she was baptized 
a few months ago. And then on the right side, you see a cemetery. Happens to be the cemetery of the first church I had the privilege of serving, Zion Evangelical Lutheran in Ridgeville Corners, Ohio. I want you to think about the beginning of our life in Christ, the wonder of holy baptism, where God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit come to live with us, now being the redeemed, forgiven children of God. And then the end of life. And for us as Christians, we have this great privilege of knowing we don't have to say a final goodbye, but in a very real way, I'll see you later in the Father's house. And after the committal in the cemetery, I have the great privilege of saying, Christ is risen. And God's people respond as they do on Easter, he is risen indeed. Alleluia. The beginning, the end. But you know it's difficult? The time's in the middle. But listen to this. Jesus says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And he does that in those middle years. But then Jesus also says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I may come that they may have life and have it to the full. How does he do that? Well, last week we began a series going through 1 Thessalonians to take a look at different aspects of what it means to be church. Last week we talked about church being family. Well, this week we're going to talk about our family story. So here's what we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. St. Paul writes, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. Do you hear that? That opposition between baptism, between our death and going to heaven. There are those middle years and the evil one comes and brings opposition. You can read about the outrageous things that happened to Paul and others in Philippi, if you read through Acts chapter 16, how there was a riot after Paul drove out a demon from a young lady who was a slave and was telling fortunes and making her owner a lot of money. And as soon as the money supply was dried up, well, there was antagonism against Paul and others. They were thrown into jail, even though they were Roman citizens, beaten before that. But then the Lord sent an earthquake at midnight, the gates of the prison sprung open. The jailer was about to kill himself because he thought that Paul and the others would escape. But Paul said, don't harm yourself, or we are all here. Paul and the others who had been singing hymns and praying to the Lord, which undoubtedly that jailer heard. So he has Paul and the others come to his house where he bandages and cleans up their wounds and then listens as they share the gospel, the good news. And the whole family is changed. They're baptized. And then Paul is led out by the magistrates who found out he was a Roman citizen and treated him improperly. They led him out of the city. And now he goes to Thessalonica and begins preaching the gospel. And it has results. But then again, there are his antagonists who come. God does something great. The evil one tries to mess it up. Now, I don't know about you, I know about me. When things get very difficult, one of the first things that comes to mind is, why am I doing this? Why do I bother? And so this leads to this question, does hard work pay off? Because let's face it, there are some times where we've spent a lot of time and effort into things, but it seems like there are no results. And we can understand how Paul, who's constantly being persecuted, as he shares the good news, would get frustrated but does hard work pay off? Well, here's the answer. It depends on what you wish to accomplish. And what did Paul wish to accomplish? Well, let's go on. He writes, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we care for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, 
and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Did you notice how Paul talks about being like a mother and a father, a parent? And for any good parent, what is your motivation? It's always love, and you want what is best for your kids. Now, again, if you were watching last week or maybe we're here in person, you remember that we talked about agape love, and we talked about how it's not based on feelings because there are times where we don't feel like loving people. But we look past things with agape love because we want what's best. And so we use the example that there are times where a child might not agree with what a parent's doing and says, I hate you. But what's a parent going to do? Say, I hate you back? No. A parent looks past that and a parent is going to do the hard work of loving a child and working to do what is best. So I think back to when our kids were young and for one reason or another, Family conflicts in our household usually took place right before bed. And if it were in the summertime and the windows were open, I've cracked jokes about, oh man, we have to quickly go around and close the windows because otherwise the neighbors are going to be thinking there's a minister yelling at his kids again. Well, maybe it wasn't that bad. But the fact of the matter is conflicts are never easy. And you know what would happen then? I'd have the great privilege of doing something. You see, at nighttime, before bed, we would also gather for prayer, and I would tell stories. I'd make stories up. In fact, today's puppet time character, Maurice the Friendly Black Bear, came from, well, stories that I would make up about Maurice. But here's something else. When we would have those conflicts, there was another story I love to tell, the true story of God's word about forgiveness, and I would have to ask for forgiveness sometimes, saying, you know, Dad didn't handle this the best. Dad was more upset than he needed to be. Please forgive me. But then also, when my kids would say, look, we've done things wrong, please forgive us, you know what we'd get to say? The wonder of the story, tomorrow is a new day. That's the joy we have. The joy we have in Jesus because he comes to us in the midst of those times when the evil one brings those attacks. And sometimes when we're physically being attacked with illnesses or whatever, we start wondering if we've done something to offend you, God. Are you mad at us for bringing this to us? Or sometimes when he brings up reminders, memories we wish we could erase of things we've done or said which just weren't good, which weren't in keeping with following our Lord Jesus Jesus comes and says it's a new day. This is why I came, born of the virgin, very God of very God, becoming true man, not to give you a new rule book, but to give you myself. To do that hard work where the evil one would fight against me. But you see, it is worth it because I accomplished what only God could accomplish. And so Jesus went, didn't he, to the cross to be that lamb of God to be the perfect sacrifice, to cover the guilt of your sin, my sin, the sin of the whole world. When he rose on Easter, he made clear this is all true. Whoever believes in him won't perish, will have eternal life. There is going to be a day, yes, when our bodies will be buried in the ground, but then we'll be raised by the power of God to life eternal. We'll be with Jesus, seeing him face to face, being with the saints, the archangels, all the company of heaven, rejoicing in this wondrous good news, our family story is true. I love telling bedtime stories, but now take a look at this picture. Do you see what we have here? We have an older parent with a grown child. In the back is a swing set, kids swinging on it, and you know, Ellen and I were gone the last couple of days and just a very quick trip here and there in the state of Wisconsin. And we were at a park, Mothy Lake State Park. And in this park, there is one of those old swing sets. And it has saddle swings. And for pastor, it's like a magnet. So I jump on that, 60 years of age, on this swing. 
having a great big smile on my face as I'm going back and forth. But you know, there might be a day in my life where I'm not going to be able to do that. And my kids are going to have to be taking care of me as I used to take care of them. But you know what else is there? Just as I told them their stories and they enjoyed it, there's going to be a time where they're going to have to tell me stories. Because there's one story in particular I'm going to need to hear. Know what it is? Well, you might look at this word and say, it's all Greek to me. It is. It's the word oengelion. We see the verse from Mark 16. Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's what that Greek word means. Gospel. Good news. That's the story I always will need to hear. That in Jesus, we have a brand new day. In Jesus, beginning in the waters of holy baptism, I'm connected to all he's accomplished for me. And someday, just as he broke through the barrier of death and the grave victorious, so through him, I'll do the same. And especially as I get to that point of life, which I hope is many years from now, when I'll be thinking more about going to heaven, you know what? The evil one's going to come all the more and try to remind me of all the things I've done wrong and try to show me how bad a parent maybe I was or how ineffective a pastor I may have been. Whatever it is, I'll need to hear that story. But in Jesus, it's a new day. That good news of what he's done for me, that in God's grace alone, by his undeserved love alone, through faith in Christ alone, as is made clear in the scriptures alone, that family story, I'm saved. So think about it this way. Psalm 46, as these beautiful bookends, the first and last verse, the first verse, God is our refuge and strength, in ever-present help in trouble. And the last verse, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. As we're in the midst of the middle, the times when the evil one is attacking, we come back to that good news of who our God is, where he is, and what he's done for us in Jesus. Oh, St. Paul rejoiced in the Thessalonians. He said, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. Not as a human word, but as it actually is. The word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. You know, as we celebrate the Reformation, it's much more than having a history lesson. It's about celebrating the here and now. We, as church, are family. And our family has a particular story. And the center of this story is Jesus and the gospel. The good news of who he is, what he's done for us, and what will be ours. The joy of the Father's house. And so we pray that as his church, we're constantly centered on that word. We don't add to it, we don't subtract to it, but we always emphasize to that good news. And we pray that as we know people who maybe don't understand it, that the Holy Spirit works in their lives and that in our family here, from generation to generation, that continues to be passed along. Because we all will get to a point where we'll be needing to hear those bedtime stories again. And what a wonderful way to go asleep in Jesus. Hearing again that wondrous good news that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. And as Luther might say in the catechism, this is most certainly true. Thank you.
restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. In the day of my trouble, I call to you, for you answer me. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. Save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. Gracious Lord, we bring before you all who have been affected by the senseless shooting in Maine, and we ask your blessing upon all the first responders and those working for the safety and protection of all of our communities. We also pray for your intervention and peace in the Middle East. Gracious Lord, we pray for all we know who are looking forward to surgeries or recovering from them. We ask that you would grant your hand of healing and strength upon them. We pray for all we know going through treatment for cancer and other things, for the homebound and their caregivers. Gracious Lord, we bring before you all we know who do not know you, Lord Jesus, as the way, the truth, and the life. Holy Spirit, work through word and sacrament that people would come to know anew the joy of your salvation and use us to be people who remain not only steadfast in your word, but have great joy in sharing the joy of Jesus with all around us. Together we pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Thank you so much for making it a priority in your day to join me for worship here at Beautiful Savior. My prayer for you is that each day, as you have time in that word, God the Holy Spirit would help you to not only know the truth of that word, but to see you in our family story and to know the joy of Jesus, the fact that by God's grace alone through faith in Christ, in Christ alone as revealed in the scriptures alone, we can give all glory to God alone not just now, but indeed looking forward to the day when we'll celebrate with all the church for all eternity. God be with you. Have an excellent rest of the day.